Hi, I'm Femi OK and you're in the stream. Today is education inequality, creating a lost generation in Hong Kong. So we are in so much trouble with the school teachers in Hong Kong right now. Malika Palau, digital producer of the stream, because we are being tweeted yeah. by students exactly. and it's early. Yeah, we will be in trouble once yep. the teachers wake up. <laughs> so we are getting tweets from Hong Kong and from right. students and they're sharing their personal experiences. Sure. Like this video comment sent in by Sumi. Have a listen. Student in Hong Kong of Nepali descent. I've been studying in uh, Hong Kong for eight years now and I still can't uh, communicate in Chinese fluently. I can read and write only the basic Chinese. Our classes are divided into two parts, uh, EMI classes and CMI classes. I think that really holds us back from knowing the Chinese uh, students better, uh, communicating with them and fitting into the Hong Kong society. Well, she references English medium instruction and Chinese medium instruction. We'll get into that during today's show, but we can't do it without you. So tweet us with the hashtag AJStream. And remember, you keep us on our toes regarding the story ideas. So share them with us and things that you would like to see covered. You can post them on Instagram using the hashtag AJStream or comment on our page. Just go to Instagram.com slash AJStream. Hi, my name is Carla McGrath and I'm the Head of Sustainability at the National Centre of Indigenous Excellence and I'm in the stream. Have Hong Kong's ethnic minority children become a lost generation? The city attracts a diverse group of immigrants from all over South Asia whose children have a hard time thriving in the education system. Education activists say it's because of Chinese language requirements and under-resourced schools where a majority of working class students enroll. After graduation, they encounter barriers to higher education and limited job opportunities. Despite moves to provide Chinese language classes, parents and students argue that's missing the bigger picture. After years of contentious education policies, how can Hong Kong help young student minorities catch up with their Chinese peers? Joining us to discuss this from Hong Kong, we have Jeffrey Andrews. He's a caseworker at the Christian Action Centre. That's a drop-in centre for refugees and his family has been in the city for three generations. Carlos Soto is a secondary school teacher and researcher who's been living in Hong Kong for the past five years. Kiran Dip Kaur is a ninth grade student of Indian origin and she's passionate about education reform. And Celeste Yoon is a former primary school teacher and a professor at the Hong Kong Institute of Education. So it's really hard to get a sense of how the inequality takes place in Hong Kong until you hear some personal stories. So I want to start with Kiran. She's 15 years old and, and you go to school in Hong Kong, Kiran, right now. If you had to explain the difference between you and maybe a Cantonese born student who was of Chinese ethnic origin, what's the difference between um, the way they go to school and how you go to school? Actually, how we go to school, it's every day we go on the street. We face a lot, a lot of discrimination. Um, but actually, Chinese people, they think they're local, so they can go freely. But whenever we go to the way of school, we get very uh, different type of stare from people, like who are they, from where they come. And then after that, when we enter the school, it's like we are divided. It's like local students and ethnic minority students. And somehow I feel like local students, usually, you know, whenever we have the assembly and those stuff, it's usually in Chinese uh, compared to English. So I feel like Chinese students, yes, they are, it's their local language, but somehow they're being, um, you know, they're being disconnected with us. That's what usually happens. And what's the difference between us? It's we are actually not having each other's culture. Okay. There's a little bit of a gap there, but your background, we are not knowing about right. each other's culture. Okay. It's like ethnic minority students know about, mm, like, I suppose I'm Indian, so I know about 
some of my Nepalese friends' culture. But Chinese, we are un we are not aware of Chinese culture, and the Chinese people are not aware of our culture. All right, so That's Karen, the biggest difference I think we are facing right. right now. All right, Karen, let, let me bring in Jeffrey. He's a little bit older than you, but he also went to school in Hong Kong. Jeffrey, yes. is, does does that resonate what Karen was saying? I mean, as I said, for me. Um, nine years of compulsory education, free education from the government. I have never sat next to a Chinese person. Uh, how how is that possible? How, how is that even possible? Um, it's possible because we, uh, ethnic minorities, are put into segregated schools. Um, so even if we do go to school with local Chinese, we are segregated. Um, so we have the English section and the non-Chinese section, or the Chinese section and the non-Chinese section. Malika? Well, you know, it, it's interesting, Jeffrey mentioned ethnic minority, and so there are some members of our community who want us to really break that term down. Mm -hmm. uh, Miguel on Facebook writes in, there are many ethnic minority groups, there's Australian, there's British, there's French, among others, but do kids from these, same, these groups face the same issues as kids from Nepali or Pakistani working class backgrounds? Anyone living in Hong Kong knows the answer, he says. So, Carlos, I'd like to direct that to you. What is the difference, and can you explain that for our international audience? Sure. I mean, uh, Hong Kong calls itself an international city, which means that there's a, a community of people coming from all parts of, of the world. Um, the difference is that you have a, a large communities of South Asian heritage, we're talking uh, Pakistan, uh, Nepal, India, who are actually uh, been part of the cultural fabric in Hong Kong for much longer. Um, Either they came here, you know, three, four generations ago, and sometimes longer ago for business, or as some part of a British military force. And so, particularly um, Nepali, Pakistani um, originated people are tend to be stuck in intergenerational cycles of poverty. So they actually are very local themselves. Sometimes they've been here much longer than people of uh, Chinese ethnic background, but they're kind of stuck uh, for the most part in working class uh, positions or even positions of poverty. So this has a basis, Celeste, in 1997 where the British handed over Hong Kong as a British territory, handed it back to China. Something very specific happened in 1997 to the schools. Can you explain to our audience what happened? Uh, well, yeah, the, oh, Celeste, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You mean since 1997 when Hong Kong uh, rejoined China? Um, I think uh, when the education system to have turned back to the uh, Chinese government, not much ha happened in terms of policy, but there will be a kind of increasing emphasis on the Chinese language in the society. Okay, for example, if you want to find a job, you need to have certain uh, level of Chinese competence, otherwise you won't be able to get admitted. Um, before the changeover, I think uh, some South Asians, they were admitted to the civil service um, organization because they are quite good in terms of English. But without basic Chinese, they were still okay, qualified to do that. But uh, after since the changeover of the sovereignty, then um, I think everyone who wanted to enter into civil service, they need to have certain kinds of uh, Chinese competence. Sure. That's the only thing that we can see. And all bring up the kind of uh, earlier discussion about the segregation between Chinese and non-Chinese students um, under the same school, um, under the school roof. I think that uh, have been changed recently, but unfortunately this has only happened in the past uh, couple of years, when the government gradually address the issue that uh, we need to have an early integration of non-Chinese students, not to reject them, not to chase them out of the mainstream schooling. Therefore, so, so Celeste, what do you mean by early integration? Because are they literally kept separate? You have Chinese students here and other ethnic minorities over here and, they, and they're not allowed to mix? Or does it happen because of finances or because of language? I, I just want to make sure that our audience understand why there okay. is this difference. All right. I think language barrier is the main uh, difference right. between the two groups. Well, the government classify whoever mother tongue is not Chinese, we call it non-Chinese speaking students, NCS. Okay. So if they are um, um, Indian, Pakistani, Nepali, Filipino, etc., etc., they call it um, this salvation people as non-Chinese speaking uh, students. But the point is, um, even though they admitted into the uh, school, as um, some of them have said, it's Jeffy, or was that Jeffy? Saying that um, they will have an English class, a Chinese class, 
or um, kind of a different uh, recess times so that they won't mix up to, together. Okay. I think uh, one good reason could be to, to avoid the kind of uh, communication barriers. Mm. Um, All right, so it's a language thing. But Kieran, do you have Chinese friends? Uh, yes, I do have Chinese friends and uh, somehow I feel like language is not only the thing which right. is coming in between us. How's your, how's your Cantonese? Is, it's okay, I can speak, I can have a conversation, I can have a conversation with a person. Mm -hmm. It's not too good, but it's okay. At least I can have a conversation with my friends. And what I would like to say is uh, language, it's yes, it's a piece of it, but it's not the biggest problem. I think the biggest problem, according to me, it's we are not taught to be communicate with each other. Like we, how, how do you how do you no teach that? How do I, how do you teach two kids just to talk to each other? Well, it has to start from how the education. How do you talk system. to each other? I yeah. think while you are in the classes, somehow knowing about each other can right. make you to talk about each other. All right, can so make you to have a communicate. All right, Jeffrey, what did you say? Just say that I mean, again. If I, if I may add, because it has to start from kindergarten onwards. You have to have this, you know, kids sitting with each right. other, not not yeah. see any exactly. differences in skin color if or language, and then you can start speaking the language Cantonese. You know, I was forced to learn Cantonese because I was discriminated on the football pitch, and I thought. I need to pick up this language and know what they're talking about me. And I just but struggled and I picked it up. But I still have friends who study with me all the way through secondary school until high school who still till today cannot speak the language. Uh, and that exactly. is a pity. And it's, it's a sad reality of what is Hong Kong. Now, Jeffrey, you said it has to start from kindergarten. There's a couple of people here that are chiming in on, on this discussion on language, particularly. Mm -hmm. Reshma mm -hmm. tweets in, she lives in Hong Kong. She says, learning Chinese helps to communicate with local people in Hong Kong, but there's been a problem for many students to learn this language. We also got a video comment from someone who elaborates a little more on this theme. Jeffrey, have a listen to this. Last year, I volunteered at a government primary school, helping the ethnic minority kids there with their homework. Although the school was Chinese medium, the teachers there didn't really take into account the fact that their students came from non-Chinese speaking backgrounds. I think that Chinese language lessons would be extremely helpful for these kids, but more importantly, their teachers also need to be trained to be culturally competent and sensitive. For me, I studied Hindi in and Urdu in college, and it was really helpful to connect with these kids when English and Cantonese weren't enough. So, Jeffrey, she says many of these kids come from non-Cantonese-speaking backgrounds. Has that been the experience um, in your case? Likewise, like me. I mean, this is not my mother tongue. You know, we speak you know, English, we speak you know, our own language like Hindi or what, what not. But again, in Hong Kong, you know, for the, for the local Chinese, they have two kinds of exams for the English language, which was syllabus A and B, which was, uh, I think the syllabus A was an easier option for them to take. Why can't they have the same thing for us? Or you know, we do need remedial classes, we do need support. Yes, it's not our mother tongue, but, you know, today we see a reporter of Pakistani descent. She is a local Chinese reporter, uh, and, and it's possible, but we just need a little bit more, you know, effort, and, and I think the government has to put more effort in, in making this happen, or else, again, it's a vicious mm -hmm. cycle for us. Carlos, so, I, 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 I yeah, yeah, go ahead. I just, I feel like jumping in because already the conversation is, is being limited to this issue of, of language, because I think it's, we can grab onto it easy, it's, it's very convenient, but I think, you know, Kieran was trying to allude to the fact that it's a lot more than that, and so uh, you really have uh, a system of education that more and more, it's based on how much money you have. And so I, there's something that we call uh, the shadow um, education industry here, which is just this tutorial industry that I participate in, uh, where you know it's very common for students to spend about a thousand dollars U.S. per month just to get additional help on on their studies. And so more and more, money is what determines what level of education you get in in Hong Kong. And what we see in, in our school, we have about 50 percent uh, ethnic Chinese students, 50 percent non-ethnic Chinese students is that uh, one of the big barriers is that uh, working class poor Chinese students themselves are very marginalized in the society and in the education system. Car and so, Carlos, how um, do you fix that? Because the, the way you teach is, is a different way of teaching. Is, is that one way of, of fixing? Can you explain your, your teaching style? Sure. I think, you know, in Hong Kong, we're very lucky to have all kinds of resources, but the, the major mode of teaching here, like other parts of the world, is a teacher comes in, they have a textbook, and you basically have to memorize what's in the textbook. 
Uh, there might be a little PowerPoint, but that's, that's it. This is what we call a transmission pedagogy. I've got some knowledge. I'm going to shove it into your head. It doesn't work for teaching um, Chinese. It doesn't work for teaching English. But I think maybe Karen can explain it a little bit more because yeah, she's I my... Yeah, I want to explain it. Um, actually, great, I would like to explain it. Um, actually, Mr. Carlos Soto, he's my teacher, so I can explain his way of teaching compared to my other teacher's way of teaching. Actually, uh, my other teachers, what they mainly focus is, guys, listen, you have examination, focus on that. This is your syllabus. This is what we are supposed to learn. But Mr. Carlos Soto, sometimes when he sees some kind of problems going in our class, he take out that subject, which helps us a lot. And then he try to teach us on that basis, which we learn about our social life and which will, which, by which we can cope many problems in our life. And yes, we do get the same education that other international schools get. We are not lacking behind. I think by the help of Mr. Carlos Soto, we are learning something which is extra and which is really useful in our life. Without it, I don't think we can really have a better life. I think that's the way for us to cope with our situation and that teaching that way of teaching just gave me a hope to carry on learning that's that's uh, the you thing. know she, Karen, Karen said something in there that we really have students who sit in classrooms and they don't have uh, a lot of hope in their lives and oftentimes mm -hmm. they feel like a need for love a need for belonging is not being fulfilled a lot of these kids uh, their parents work two jobs uh, they, they rarely see their parents really have that guidance and so they're in schools that don't help them to meet these needs that they have in their lives. It's, and it's, so uh, is it the actual, Carlos, I'm just trying to get to this, okay, um, to, to, to the, the, the nub of this. Is it because the schools are not qualified to teach children who come from diverse backgrounds? Is that the yes. reason? Including students who are Chinese, who are working class. The, the school right. is not even set up for so them. So it's, it's a general criticism of the, of the Hong Kong education system then? Yes. Right. And so if, if we don't answer that question, if we don't say, how are we going to teach uh, for equity in Hong Kong? How mm -hmm. are we going to teach in a multicultural way? Then it, th these language classes won't make any difference. All right. OK, Malika. You know, I would like Karen, to hold, hold to you, just very briefly, Karen, go, go ahead, because I want to bring in some of the community because they want to talk to you as well. So very briefly, make that point. Okay. Go ahead. OK, uh, I would like to add to this, like, as Mr. C said, this is not just ethnic minorities problem, it's even local Chinese problem. All right, Chinese great, problem Kim, well. we've got that point. Let's go to the community. Well, uh, you know, on that point, I, I think what we were talking about is it's not just language. And Carlos, you've made that point. So Celeste, I want to hear from you um, based on this comment we got on Facebook. Karima says, I have a younger brother studying in a Chinese medium school, but he's failing the Chinese subject. In addition, he also needs to learn math and Chinese, and that's difficult for him. So someone else tweets in that he's an educator himself, this person writes, and I see minorities in Hong Kong facing problems not only in Chinese, but also in other subjects to ask why. Can you answer that? Why is it going across the board? I think, I think this is a very complicated issue. On the one hand, I think it's fair enough that the teachers, in this, to some extent, that are overloaded by the kind of um, examination-driven uh, system to make sure that the students are doing well academically. On the other hand, they are not interculturally sensitive enough to address the diverse uh, cultural needs. That's um, fair comments. So I, Celeste, I, I just, I, I just want to I just want to just pull you up on the culturally sensitive enough. What do you mean by that? Unpack that for me a little bit. Okay, the majority of teacher community in Hong Kong, they are local Chinese. Mm -hmm. They were born and raised in Hong Kong, right? have very limited exposure, personal exposure to other cultures. So we cannot expect them being a professional teacher at the same time being a professional cultural uh, bridges. So um, it needs a kind of deliberate attention and space for them to be trained, to further develop, to pick up the kind of a sensitivity. Sure. Honestly, because of traditionally they um, non chinese speaking students being excluded from mainstream education, they have limited uh, experience in teaching uh, non chinese speaking students. So it's a the learning curve for everybody do. then, Celeste, basically. Exactly, yes, right. to be fair to them. I, I believe that um, yeah. because the government wanted to say, okay, because of the uh, Equal Opportunity Commission right. had to enforce that uh, now you had to provide equal opportunities for all students to okay. enable success, then the teachers had to pick up new skills and 
so knowledge. So the about teachers are others? the teachers are learning the same way that the the, the, the new students or the immigrants coming into the Ye, even us, too. even the teacher yeah. educators, so we have to learn as well to pick up okay. uh, what is going on. The, the society are changing right. very so, rapidly. So let's take a breath because I've literally I'm running out of time here. I know Jeffrey wanted to jump in. Jeffrey, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say because I mean it's not just Cantonese that were struggling in that as ethnic minorities, but because the government, the workforce, the public sector has put so much emphasis on Cantonese um, that you know you as, as soon as you fail that one subject, your career prospects are done. Right. The university and this is really so important. Yeah, effect, you know, you 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 fail one. What, you don't have the motivation, in, you know, to to continue to study the rest of it. Sure. And many ethnic minorities sadly you fall into that trap. I just want to jump in here just for a moment because uh, Celeste was mentioning cult cultural sensitivity and I was on Carlos's Tumblr page here. It's uh, Hong Kong oh Teacher if you want to follow him on Tumblr. And it's something that we also featured on our web exclusive. So have a look here at my laptop. Here we are looking at a textbook from the liberal arts <laughs> discipline. and It says fill in the blanks. Perfect. So it says Japanese, Indian, yes. British, Chinese, Korean, Filipina. I am a blank. English teacher. So it would be British for the English teacher, Filipino for the domestic helper. These are the correct answers, by the way, everybody, if you didn't realize. Japanese for a sushi restaurant owner. And then uh, uh, I am Chinese and Shanghai is my hometown and, and so on and so on and so on. What is that telling us, Carlos, about Hong Kong? Unfortunately, unfortunately this is all too common at the right. primary level, at, at the secondary level, that there is a very stereotypical approach to knowledge in general. Um, because it is exam oriented, people are looking for a shortcut, a, a bite of knowledge that they can take and mm. you know, sort of throw the rest of, of the apple away. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Yoon, uh, I read some of her research and she also looked at the experiences of students who are arriving from the mainland, who are coming in, uh, sometimes speaking Putonhua. And in her research, she's also called for a multicultural approach to education and to teacher education because it affects Chinese students uh, also coming into Hong Kong. and so. Hong Kong is being accused now of, of developing a, a narrow provincialism uh, as, as a society. And so, you know, the, the government is about to spend $200 million on Chinese language education without any holistic vision right. uh, for, for what needs to happen uh, so to does, bring a society together. So, so is, everybody, is everybody up for this holistic, holistic vision then? The teachers are learning and, and then it has, to be more than, it has to be more than just paying a lot of money to, to teach everybody Cantonese. Yeah, but, you know, we need, we need teachers with an open heart. And I think mm. uh, in Dr. Yoon's research, you've got some teachers who are, are active and committed to the students. And then you've got student uh, teachers who it's like, it's like pushing a rock. Uh, and they won't move unless they have to. And a lot of the school administrations are also that way. There's some good people, but we really need more good people. We need people coming in with right. with a heart. All right. Not just Allow a, me to a, say a one board thing. Board. I think the key is... Celeste, just make it one sentence because I'm out of time right now. I, I think the, the key is about the policy. Okay. If the government have made a policy mm -hmm. to address the needs of diverse cultural needs uh, okay. in mainstream school, that will help a lot. All right, very good. So we are going to take these guests, Celeste, Carlos, Jeffrey and Kieran, to the post show at stream.outofzero.com. How is our audience reacting to this conversation? Uh, you know, I think we're getting a lot of similarities in other countries. Mm -hmm. India, places in Africa are also writing in, saying that this resonates with them as well. Okay, very good. It's not too late to join in the conversation. You can do so by tweeting us with the hashtag AJStream. It's almost like we rehearsed this yeah. then. <laughs> so on the next show, we head to Spain, where thousands of Spaniards have been chanting down with the king as calls for a referendum about the monarchy grow. Is Spain ready to become a republic? That is a big question, but a big question for our next show. Stay with us. The post show is next at stream.outofzero.com. We're talking about the Hong Kong education system and how student ethnic minorities are faring. If you have a comment to make, it's not too late. Hashtag AJ Stream. We will see you online. Thanks for watching.
again, I'm Femi OK. This is the Streams Post Show, where you get a second chance to ask questions that you may not have had time to answer during the main show. So we are back with Celeste and Carlos, Jeffrey and Kieran. I'm, I, I've heard a lot of criticism about certain kinds of schools where ethnic minorities tend to get funneled into. Can you explain that a little bit more for me, Carlos? What, what's wrong with these schools, designated schools? Uh, well, the designated schools, that's a term that uh, doesn't exist in Hong Kong anymore. But these were mm. schools that, that were set up uh, to receive additional money um, to sort of serve ethnic minority students. Now, I don't think the idea of having some schools where ethnic minority students are concentrated is a bad idea. When we look at other parts of the world, the United States, uh, Aus Australia, right. Canada, there are some of the schools that are doing the best job at serving minority and marginalized populations are the schools that bring these students in with a mission to create a different kind of learning community. And so the government, and particularly an NGO here called N uh, Unison, has been trying to sort of uh, put in policies that will do away with the ability to have this kind of a school in Hong Kong. And so I think we need some kind of a beacon school that can serve as, as a model of good teaching, of, of good practice, of providing good emotional uh, and social support, and of bringing different kinds of students, including ethnic Chinese students, together. So in the past, uh, these were students where you would have higher concentrations of ethnic minority students, anywhere from 25 up to almost 100% ethnic minority students. Uh, the school where I work at now, we're about 50% uh, Chinese, 50% um, non-Chinese. Well, Kieran, I want to bring you back in here and talk about curriculum, because that's what a few of our community members want to talk about. So right before we headed into the post show, we were talking about a textbook that Femi played. Mm -hmm. uh, she, it was on Carlos's blog. Um, Carlos, of course, this was first published um, on a blog called Hong Rong. That's on my screen here. And the publisher of the textbook has uh, defended its its uh, entry. It says, if anyone suspects the textbook is discriminating against Filipinos, it would only be the individual's personal view. So we actually got a video comment from uh, the person behind this blog. Carlos, have a listen to this. Okay. Uh, my blog was the first to post the controversial textbook. I would say it may have gone viral as the ethnic divides in post-colonial Hong Kong are rarely discussed. Um, it's very much a monocultural society and if anything since the 1997 handover from Britain the idea of Chineseness, uh, being Chinese, has, has been emphasized even more and uh, this may be important for the city's identity but minorities, many of whom have been here for generations, end up with a kind of second-class citizenship, separate schools and fewer opportunities. Carlos, do you have kids? I couldn't hear the comment. What did he say? I, I'm going to uh, wrap it up for you, but do you have kids? Wrap it up. I, I do. So in his comment, he talked about a second-class type of citizenship. Do you fear that for your child? Um, you know, uh, my wife was born in Hong Kong. She's, she's Chinese. And so, um, you know, I think my, my child is going to have a very different kind of citizenship. He's going to be probably very strong in English. Uh, he'll have Cantonese as sort of a family language, but we're probably going to push for him to also learn Putonghua. Uh, you know, we're part of China now. His motherland is China. I, I, uh, I went on a study trip to China when we took 30 ethnic minority students. And I think probably most of us, when we went there, we felt a very strong connection to, um, to the country. To say, actually, we're in Hong Kong. It's a city, but this is, this is our nation. It's, it's China. So I think my own son, because of my situation uh, is going to have a different kind of citizenship, something a little bit more Chinese, something very international. Uh, but there's something in Hong Kong where if you're not a certain kind of local, you do have a certain kind of, of second-class citizenship. I actually feel it myself a little bit when people say to me, you're not a local, you can't understand the education system. Uh, and I say to myself, I've been living here for five years, my son is born here, uh, my wife is born here, when do I get to be a local. I, I devote myself to Hong Kong. Right. Um, I see my future in China. So when am I going to be a local? 
Jeffrey, I'm just going to share a picture yeah. of you. You're sitting on the steps of the, a, a building in Geneva. You've gone to visit the United Nations, and it says on your, on your placard, Hong Kong yeah. ethnic minorities yeah. petitioned the UN to call for education policy change. I can hear Kieran reading it out loud as well. <laughs> Glad you can see it, everybody. So, Jeffrey. No, actually, the words are really blurred. Yes, the that's why I, really I read it out. And thank you for reading yeah. it with me. Okay. <laughs> I'm putting you in detention, no talking for now. Jeffrey, <laughs> what did you want to do? I mean, this is a big deal going to the UN. What is it, just wrap it up for us, that you feel is necessary for Hong Kong ethnic minorities? What is the change that you need to happen? I think there's three things. I mean, now, of course, there is no more, they say, uh, de facto segregation. That has to stop. Mm. Uh, there are, of course, the racial discrimination ordinance. There is really no law to protect us against being racially abused. Uh, uh, and I think where else better to raise this than the UN? And I think they really took you to my 29 years of uh, struggle here, you know, sure. uh, struggle mm -hmm. for um, education. Um, and then I also struggled even after that, you know, even applying for a football license, they asked me, oh, you know, you got to do it in Cantonese. And I'm thinking, wait, this is a football coaching session or a license, why do I need Cantonese? So these are the kind of things that you just do struggle, you know, with your passports. I asked them to kind of get my SAR passport because um, I don't have Chinese blood, or else there are so many discrepancies where else my friends could get it, even though they don't speak the language. Uh, ah. So it's just all these things and frustration. Mm. So finally I just said, let's go to the UN and, and let's bring up all these issues. And uh, they have taken heed and they have um, recommended some some, uh, some calls back to the government. Okay. All right, so good luck with that. Good luck with your campaigning and activism. You're going to be a social worker. I have no idea sure. what Kieran is going to be. Kieran, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> I'm sorry, I haven't decided yet. Okay, I'll get back to you in five years. Thank you very much to Celeste and Carlos and Jeffrey and Kieran. And Thank I wish you. you the very best of luck with all of your work. Thank you for Thank being you so on the stream. Now, Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. And Thank Kieran, you. stay awake in class tomorrow. Yes, I know. <laughs> Just see. Okay. There's no class tomorrow. There's all right. no class tomorrow. <laughs> Pay them down so I can tell people about the next show. Okay, on the next show, we head to Spain, where thousands of Spaniards have been chanting down with the king. As calls for a referendum about the monarchy grow, is Spain ready to become a republic? Until then, I'll see you online. Thanks for watching.